Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Epic Hidden Podcast. Today, we have a pretty special episode. Nothing less than an interview with Henry Sorbali, the founder and main composer of Monsorro. Yeah, that explanation was absolutely indispensable, right? Well, if we follow the chronology, because the last episode was an analysis of Kiven Kantaya, this would be the episode about Verisaket, which we had actually recorded already, but then we got this chance and obviously it took all the priority. The interview is nearly three hours long and was recorded in two consecutive evenings. During the first one, there was a problem with Henry's sound, which uh, got partially fixed before the second one, so sounds better. However, fortunately, most of the time he can be heard clearly, so for sure the important parts are perfectly understandable. The bad news is that Finnish Alexi couldn't join us because he was very busy with his studies and stuff. But the good news is that French Alexi joined us again, so you will hear him as well. And one more thing before we start. For this episode, we are also uploading the full video recording to YouTube. The podcast version that you're listening to right now is cleaned up as usual. Uh, I removed all the hesitations, false starts and all that stuff. It has musical fragments to illustrate what we are talking about, etc, etc, as usual. Yeah? The video version is raw with all its flaws because editing video is uh, really complicated and not always possible because it would be super awkward. But I understand that in this case it has its own value. So yeah, it ended up on our YouTube channel. The channel is simply called Moonsrow Podcast. You will find it easily. But yeah, if you just want to listen, I still recommend this podcast version. Okay, so let's go. My team is here with me. Hello, Francesco. How are you? Fine, thank you. Very excited. Mm, Sasan is here as well from the USA. How are you? Doing great. Mikkel once again from Denmark. Spectacular. And we have... In the same room, we have Thomas from France and Alexi from France, who is joining us again today. How are you guys? Hi. Good evening, Metal World. And we have our big guest today. We are interviewing no other than Henry Sorvali. Henry, thanks for being here. How are you? Thank you. Uh, absolutely fabulous and all that jazz. Nice to be here. Excellent. We're going to talk about... Moon Sorrow, obviously, from a compositional perspective and how the evolution of the band has gone. So, Sasana, I let you start. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that we've been curious to ask, not just from like the composition, but also the recording uh, stuff. But I think the first question uh, that I have is you have worked in so many different bands, uh, you work with music for a living. <clears throat> you compose for video games and different things. And I'm sure you'll occasionally just think of a melody in your head that'll just come to you. And I guess what I want to know is what is it about a song idea that to you makes you think that this is a Moon Sorrow song idea? Like, how do you think of it in terms of oh, this idea should be a Moon Sorrow thing as opposed to something else? Uh, I think it's mostly, <clears throat> there's this kind of a sadness in the stuff that I write for Moon Sorrow. It's a bit hard to explain, but it's usually the melodies and the ideas I get for the band, they're like either like rather melancholic and sad and they used to consist of melodies that aren't really fast. If you paid any attention to our melodies in general, I think that most of them are like rather like mid paced. So there's not like much of like 16th notes in there, which is like one, one first thing is that we're doing rather forward going longer melodies with longer lines. And it has to be like either that sort of sad and melancholic and sort of a longing idea and then there is this other flip side of the coin which is basically the fears and the like the aggressive like violent sort of stuff that's basically the two extreme opposites of the moon sorrow music and uh, those kind of uh, 
either click right away or they don't. And mm. when they, then I go to the computer and write them down or pay them. Is that something that developed over time? Like, was that always sort of the main idea behind it as far back as the demos or Sud and Uni? Or is that something that gradually over time kind of grew into what the band is? I think it kind of a gradual win there. From since the beginning, I think we've been doing these like flowing melodies kind of a thing. But uh, the more time has passed, the more we've started kind of a, or like I've started basically to pick up from either basket because everything in between comes kind of a naturally when you have something to grab on. You, you got to take something from both baskets, flip something to the table from either of those and then start checking out what's going to happen. And usually it kind of writes itself or it doesn't. It doesn't help shit if I just try to figure out, let's say I'm composing for, for my living. And in that case, there's no time for inspiration, basically. Inspiration is for amateurs in a way. And with Musaro, it's, which also makes it pretty slow. <laughs> process but it's also that with musoro there has to be an inspiration otherwise it's gonna just sound, it, it's just not gonna work it sounds like generic i could do generic musoro albums way too much if i wanted to but that's not something i want i want every, every album to be having a hook the album has to have some sort of an angle where to look look it from and that's why it, it needs to be like composed more like in an inspirational way instead of just sitting down and trying different things. Yes, I'm fully aware that I went pretty far away from the actual question, but I'm really that's sorry. Exactly, no, that's exactly what we're hoping for. We, we're not, it's not really the questions. We just want to kind of hear you just get to talk about Moon Sorrow. Um, oh, Alexi, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I had a question. Um, do you have a... Um one different inspiration for each each album you've made in which case what were the inspiration yes every album basically has some sort of a what i what i when i talk about these angles that's actually like one angle to to kind of a check it out from and one angle, angle to check out our albums is like that something has influenced that album a lot. And you don't basically necessarily hear it at all because it might have been, it, it might have started from one riff or one song. But for example, we take Yuma and Aika. I was struggling a lot uh, because I was doing just generic bullshit riffs and it just didn't feel like right. Then for some reason, I've no, I've listened to Ur Faust well, like, earlier but for some reason i heard one song in at, at the right moment and like everything clicked right away what if i just down tune the fuck out of this riff and then it was like somebody had just opened a, this whatever the thing is that keeps the water off and then the water starts there, there are like a lot of different inspirational sources for each album, but basically every album has some sort of a musical angle, something that gave the, the first spark. And then it's like much easier after that. When you're talking about this musical angle, is it like we're talking about the inspiration behind it and kind of what brings the whole thing together? Is it something that like if you were to try to sit down and write it in a sentence, like does it, is it something that you could explain with language or is it more of a you hear it when you hear it and you don't know exactly how to describe it is it so in other words like the inspiration behind uh an <clears throat> album could be something like um uh i want to write an album about uh middle earth and what it was like before sauron uh but it sounds here like it's more like it's uh, more abstract and more just like the kind of like tones and kind of like the emotions of the music. Well, there is uh, there is the tonal angle in a way, 
that uh, let's I'm gonna back go a bit backward first. So basically, I've tried all the fucking methods available during these twenty plus years to write music for Moons or all it because I always need the first thing to like kick off. So I've been trying different things like. For example, with this new album, we are still constructing. Don't ask, no estimates. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we had a really, really long, like hours long discussion, actually two of those, with Bill last, last summer. And he told me about the idea that he's been trying to like write down and the story the backstory of the album yeah i know i didn't want to write a concept album but this unfortunately seems like it he said to me <laughs> and we started to think about okay how could this work musically and uh, maybe if we go to place b maybe that place b should also be like somehow interpreted in the music as well so as a hypothetical idea which i'm not gonna say we're doing or we're not gonna do but you never know. But for example, let's take the easy road. We would go to a very, very dark, damp and fucking slow motion place. And we would play slow music with the low tuned guitar, for example. Mm -hmm. These are kind of things that we actually talk about. Maybe we want to do one song where we tune the guitars down to B. Something that we've actually been talking <clears throat> only like for a novelty for one song for one album no, so don't don't expect us to go full incantation soon but uh we we've been trying or i've been trying to like have that sort of an angle i've tried to have whatever angles i go i go to the woods and i go to the nature rapids whatever only to figure out that after all i need the musical spark to start the actual fire uh, and then everything else that I've been thinking all about, like, let's say that I go to the nature and the forest and I spend hours in forest trying to find an inspiration, like uh, whatever good pagan composer would do. But, you, you know, it just doesn't work if you don't have any musical ideas, because after all, the musical ideas are the one which keep people listening to your music. They, they, if they want to listen to forest, they can go to forest. Yeah. But obviously they want metal music. So there has to be some sort of an idea for the metal music to actually start evolving and to to begin the creation process, if you get my point. I think you mentioned in a blog post some time ago a little bit about your writing process. And I think you were talking about like riffs and how like a, a song idea isn't necessarily just about one riff. It's about like the overall structure of the song and how things go together. Maybe that is something you said, maybe you didn't, but I guess you're talking about like musical ideas and I'm curious, like what, what do those musical ideas like normally entail? Is it a melody? Is it a more of like a instrumentation thing? Like what if we were tuned down for this album? Um, or do you think in terms of like structures, is it a mixture of all of those? Like let's, and, and you can maybe even use a specific example of some song, like where does a song start and kind of like what fills out as, as time goes? So basically what I did in the blog post was I was more referring to, to the Fintroll compositional process in that, uh, which is a bit, or rather fucking more straightforward than Moon Sorrow one. And mm. uh, with Moon Sorrow, the composing process is a bit different because you basically want the song to tell you where to go. Well, where in Fintroll, you you tell the song. You, you're the master in Fintroll's music. And uh, well, when it comes to Moon Sorrow, I'm just a mere slave of the music in a way that it, needs it starts and it needs to start and and go to live its own life and i'm just trying my best to like keep up with it and see what happens and that's also one thing that makes moon sorrow way way harder to compose in a way because i want it to be really like 
the, the songs need to go naturally. They are so fucking long songs. And here's the answer to the long songs, by the way. Uh, yeah. They are so long because I want the song, basically. I know it sounds fucking cheesy, but, but I want the song kind of a tell me where to go. Of course, I the, one of the biggest problems I have with Moonsaro is that I could go like, I have I have no idea if you can see my hand because I can see myself now. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. Yes, we do. Yeah. Tan ten tin. Editing in. Okay, now he's extending his arm and he's showing us that he wrote up until the wrist and then his hand is open and the five fingers are five possible ways to continue the song. Tin ten tan. Editing done. Imagine that I've composed a song until this point, and then this part comes. What the fuck? Then I'm gonna try every single path of this, drive myself completely fucking nuts, get back to this part. Maybe if I just put the guitars to play a bit differently, then I try them out, and then I'm sort of, oh fuck, I'm gonna fucking lose my brain and nerve, and I'm gonna check in for a hospital to for sanity or something. Yeah. So, so that's like whenever I try to compose more sorrow, like too analytically, that stuff happens. So it's kind of a beast that you need to get, you, you need to like stay a bit cautious about. Like don't try to tame the beast. It will, you, you'll be the slave for that forever. Don't try to change it. I've tried to change it. It doesn't work like that. Does that come with, because, you know, uh, Moon Sorrow has uh, a following and a fan base. And one of the really interesting things about Moon Sorrow is how different the sound is all the time, you know, um, album to album. And we recently on the podcast talked about Very Zaket and, you know, obviously how different that is from Kivan Kanteya. So what is it like for you trying to follow the music wherever it's taking you but knowing you have people who are coming in with a certain set of expectations how does that yeah what's that dynamic like for you again there could be two answers we seem to be a really dualistic band in a way uh on the other hand i i make the music first to myself and the, the, there, I have to, I'm not saying I, I need to please my personal God, but in a way, I, I, I need to be worthy for myself and, and the things that I believe in musically and as, aesthetically. Then it has to please my bandmates. And after that, it's everything else. But as long as these two out of three would get fulfilled, I, I, I honestly don't give a shit because I am aware that we have a lot of fans. I'm aware that people are having expectations. They might get disappointed. But what they would what I would never do to the fans, you know, everybody can can disappoint their asses off. I'm sorry about that if, if that happens. But that's not something I can basically help help you guys. I can't please every single person in this planet who loves our band. But what I can promise to everybody is, is that there will never ever gonna be a half-assed generic Moosaro album. So that's the flip side of the coin. You might get disappointed, but at least you're not gonna get like a, another ball thrower album. And I fucking love ball thrower, but you probably get my point. You won't get another thrash metal battery album. Yeah, although that would be cool. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure though that, that what we are and going to do is that we're never gonna do like a we're never say never. We're never gonna do like a rock album or whatever trash metal album or, or a synthless album. So these are like there are certain if you if you take our albums and you try to put them on a like a peak style, like to one place, there are there are definitely things that combine uh, that, that 
you can say that given kantaja and Jumalten aika have, have pretty many things in common, even though they sound completely fucking different to each other. And uh, I think in, in that, that sense, it always kind of a sounds like moor sorrow. And there is this certain, the wall of synth and a lot of melodies and basically the melancholy and sadness combined with aggressive stuff. Those are the, like the building blocks of Mozart's music in a very, very general kind of a, like very characteristic sense of speak. And as long as those are present, we're still pretty much going to sound like our band. If we would go like, let's say a rock, rock and roll album, like this fucking bad, bad down to rock music or, or trash metal, they, those aspects of our music would suffer so badly that it would be impossible for us to do. For example, a trash metal albums, we couldn't use synth. And I don't know, maybe I've just heard wrong trash metal albums during the last 35 years, but there aren't a lot of like melancholic melodies or something like that in trash metal albums. So, so you probably get my point. There are some some things that we are not able even to go to go or to change into, even though we want it, because that would be like a step too far. We could technically make a very dry trash metal sound for the album and mix the synths lower and maybe Villa would screech more Miller style but uh, it would probably still sound like Moonsoro but just like a shitty fucking trash metal version of it and nobody would like that at, at least me I didn't I wouldn't like that maybe here thing. we should ask you some questions about the album that you completely trashed before making you Malton Ica. Did you feel that was a half-assed thrash metal <laughs> album? What album was that? The one you you scrapped the entire thing and redid your Martin Eike. Yeah, well, it wasn't a whole album mm. in a way, but let's say ha- half an album. Yeah, well, it it sounded basically like leftovers from Variona album. So, you know, we did that album already, and uh, it's it's done. And I don't know; it's actually the least, my least favorite album of our our catalog. Catalog. But uh, it has some good things, and retrospectively thinking, it's a bit boring and doesn't necessarily have the. It has the right sound for the material, but it's. It was something I wanted to try out, only to figure out that that's not maybe after all the style I want to do. So we went back to basically the old dog. Yeah. So, so talking about that one, the the breathing yeah. blood remix that you did, what about what made you do the that remix? Well, to be honest, I was getting my hands m- more to mixing anyway at that point. And as I already at that point started to feel that maybe maybe we should have still mixed it a bit differently. I mean, don't get me wrong. We loved the mix when it came out. We loved the master. And we were fucking satisfied. It, it became just as we depicted it in our heads and just as we wanted. It's just that maybe we wanted something that we didn't know how, how, how well it tests time in our heads. So we were really satisfied when we did it, but not soon after, uh, at least I started to drift more to a different sort of sound. And I wanted to try out mixing in general, like I got some new plugins and stuff like that. And I thought that this would be a perfect that time. I have the multi tracks here, so maybe I could try to make this a bit different version. Ironically enough, I think it resembles, well, not, not of course 100%, but it's definitely drifting more to the Jumaltenaika sound, the, the breathing blood mix, which was kind of a predecessor for the Jumaltenaika sound. 
if you take it that from that angle. What you're saying makes perfect sense about how, you know, you have this vision for an album and you follow it through and then maybe later on you change or you grow or things are different. And uh, what I'm curious is what are some of the albums you mentioned right now? Varjoina isn't necessarily one of the ones that feels the most relevant for you, but I'm just curious right now, looking back, what are some of the Moon Sorrow albums that you enjoy the most right now? Well, uh, it's a bit trick question in a way that I don't enjoy my albums in general. <laughs> when they're done, they're done. But yeah, I, I've said to the guys earlier that, uh, and it's still relevant in 2022, my two favorite albums from Moon Sorrow are Jumalta Naaka and Verisäkkeet which kind of makes sense because if you you can basically you, you could basically skip uh 10 years from very second and hop, hop straight to you Maltenaka from very second yeah I, I think that represents for me the the sound I like for the band to have and and you have to rephrase your question because I already forgot what you asked. So no, of. you answered it. The so what I'm wondering is you're working on this new album, right? And what are the albums that kind of still play a role really strongly in the Moon Sorrow sound that you want? And it sounds like or or well, you mentioned earlier the different things that you want to try. So it's not just a very saket Umaltanaika sound. But those are the ones that I think have held up the best in your mind. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's also a big thing why since we since since we stepped out from the studio, from the mixing mixing session from uh Yumata Naka and, and made the master of the album and, and it was like done delivered. And I wasn't like, man, I fuck you, I don't want to see these guys. I don't want to hear this from this band for the next five years. No, I was more like, okay, guys, uh, when do we start to do more stuff? So it's been like that for for every every one of us. I think like the Umalta Naika sessions were like really, really, the composing process was fucking hard and we've taken some drastic measures to prevent that to happen this time. But uh, generally, like, uh, I think Umalta Naika is ironically enough, I don't know if it's our seventh album or so. But uh, I don't think we've ever like been this still after like it's done over five years ago. And we're still like having this flame burning. Guys, we really should do more stuff. 
but the problem is of course that when, when you don't have this angle like the spark where to start from and we we could do a fucking you mouth and like a part two next week we can book studio and do it but nobody mm. it wouldn't be good mm. so that that's a like also that that angle in that album it, it it's the one that seems to have pleased all, also many other band members a lot for various reasons but i need to also put give and gone by a very high basically more i think mostly because of its sheer fucking insane ambition it had because we were just like 25 20, 22 24 five year old guys and we basically didn't do shit but or like we didn't know shit and we tried to like do so ambitious things that we were like well, to this day i'm still not sure how it actually ended up so well i think it's it's really i think it's our most popular album if i'm mm-hmm. understood correctly and I can I can easily understand why. Besides, it has a fucking good sound, and like it's it's rather easy to. If you want to check out Moons or maybe the first two albums are a bit old sounding in a way, or like bad, like not very complex and rather simplistic. And then the next albums may be a bit too much for somebody who's not definitely into ah! kind of a things. <laughs> But I, I think Kivan Kantaya is one of those albums in our career that is like, it's this one size fits all. It seems that everybody likes it, usually. Some yeah. people think it's woozy. But I'd it. like to, to ask something uh, related to Kivan Kantaya and the early albums, uh, which uh, have a lot of uh, folk uh, elements in them. Uh, of course, folk music is a constant element in your into your sound, but in the early albums, uh, we can find uh, uh, a lot of folk melodies, and also you had uh, guests like uh, uh, Hitta Weinen uh, uh, in the in the very Saket album. I mean, uh, I'd like to to know more about your relation with uh, folk music. And uh, we also know you are a multi-instrumentalist, uh, so uh, you play accordion. And uh, I'd like to know uh, how did you come into contact with this kind of music? And uh, if you are used to uh, listen to some genre or uh, you know well a uh, folk tradition. Yeah, I, I've been like... Uh baptized or well, bathed in folk music since I was born basically my father used to play a lot of like uh, bands at the time I was born and uh, that was in the 70s and uh, of course you you know that the progressive rock music was really really hot stuff in the 70s and uh, I don't know about other countries I think in England at least Marco could probably answer me this right away but uh there was this some sort of like a national romantic revival in those prog bands a lot in the 70s which mm-hmm. also meant a shit ton of finnish progressive bands used folk elements in their music and due to my dad like having so much connections to the progressive music scene in general uh and finland anyway being the agrarian shithole it was at the time Folk music was pretty much like a, it, it. It was always there for me. So the so, more I just grew yeah. up, I, I realized the the more spiritual aspect of it, and kind of a took a deep dive to that stuff when I was a teenager. If that answers your question. Yeah. So I, I guess you were used to. Uh, Jet Rotal and uh, Griffon, these kind of bands. Yeah, but to be honest, those Jet Rotals and Griffons and, and those I've only like, uh, I, I've found them like in the 2000s. So mm. it was, they're like a late finds in that sense for me. I remember like hearing Aqualung in high school, which was you know, like 
94, 95. And uh, when the first riff kicks in, this what the fuck? This is like Black Sabbath, but bad. So I, I've lost all my interest on Jet Rotal for like the next five years or so, right, right away. Thank mm-hmm. you, Aqua. You could have been heavy horses, but no, you have to be Aqua. It's really interesting that you're talking about this mixture of folk music and progressive music, which is so opposite of each other in theory, right? Like you think of progressive as being so like pushing certain compositional pushing the envelope and time signatures and synths and think of folk music as being like GCD chords and that the sort of opposite of those working together is very much alive in Moon Sorrow. You know, it's, um, it's much more progressive than a lot of, I, you know, I, I know that you guys don't like to put a genre on it, but most black metal bands aren't doing, you know, a lot of five, four time signatures and, you know, like very saket, like you do Hoska starts in a weird time signature and Karun Kinsey and stuff like that. And it's interesting how much of the, even the folkiest stuff that Moon Sorrow does still has this progressive element. I thought that was really interesting that you described your kind of early experience with that kind of music and how that's still a very uniquely Moon Sorrow quality. Actually, I, I need to correct on that one. I, I started to think about the Haska. Haska actually doesn't start with like weird uh, time signatures at all. But mm. what Haska has is that there are like these extra bars. And yeah. those are actually not that much taken from progressive music, but those are actually super folk stuff. Mm. And as a fun anecdote, uh, check out, for example, old Saturican albums. There are so fucking many riffs that have this like folky stuff, and then they have this like extra two bars mm-hmm. or like extra, extra, extra two beats, but you don't even notice it because it just it flows so naturally. And uh, there is this uh, Norwegian band, Hades, later mm-hmm. called as Hades Almighty, one of one of huge influences in Moonsoro's music. In their album, Dawn of the Dying Sun from 1997, there is a song called Pagan Prayer, which has this awesomely cool violin, like a uh, Nykelharpa kind of a thing at, at the end. I think it's actually a real violin. Anyway, uh, that has like this... Uh, very traditional thing that you have a folk melody and then you kind of have this like uh, extra punctuation to repeat the pattern last two beat pattern but a bit differently and then you go back to the to the loop so to say again And uh, those things we utilize a lot. And for what it comes to the 5-4 thing, I think that's not so uncommon in folk music in general, but maybe it's because I have these uh, 70s progressive folk metal glasses 
which I'm looking through to this thing. So it might be that it's actually not common in folk music, but because of 70s prog, I think it is. But I think it actually is. They are like uh, I have some folk music recordings at home which utilize the 5-4 thing, for example. That being said, though, they are not recorded in whatever, 1865 or something like that. So yeah. the fuck I know. Well, and I mean, a lot of the folk music scene of later isn't necessarily what it traditionally was like. And, you know, folk music, you think of like, it, it, it's different everywhere in the world, which is the whole point of it, right? It's the music of those folks. But, yeah, but um, the folk music keeps evolving. That's kind of a, that's the, I, at least for me, sorry I interrupt you. But no. I, I'm going all canny West here. Sorry to interrupt you, but I need really <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that the, one of the most important things in folk music has been the kind of, a, it's it's never stuck there. Like folk, if you take folk musicians in, in 2020s, they're like, uh, they've been already like experimenting like 20 years, 40 years for with different stuff. Take, for example, Garmarna, who implementing industrial stuff and whatever drum and bass loops to their folk music in 90s already so folk folk musician folk musicians and folk as a genre has always been extremely like uh, open to new influences and trying different things and i think that's something that's been always going in hand in hand in hand with folk music because i think it comes from the idea that you have this bunch of pub musicians somewhere in the countryside and they're so fucking bored to play the same songs over and over so they start to experiment and it kind of a, gets to everybody's mind as a mindset that hey we can do all sorts of weird things and then stuff happens or i could be horribly wrong but who knows it's uh really cool to hear you talk about like the specifics of like a moon sorrow song like uh, like Hoska or like adding the bars or or where that comes from i think something that we all do as fans when we're like listening back to these albums is trying to try to figure out or try to try to think of like how the sausage gets made so to speak right so i wonder like if there is a song and if not, we can pick a song and just talk about it. But uh, it'd be really interesting to hear just with the specific example of a song, what the process of starting a song to, to finishing, like, do you demo it? Like, what, what, what do you use to do that? What software do you end up using? What do the different stages of this song look like? Um, is, is Weird, bad. <laughs> Completely, they they could be like twenty five versions of one song, basically. Let's take Pimea as an example. If you remember the process of where you started and where you ended with that song, um, yeah, well, that <laughs> you picked up a great, great example. I, I I have a lot to tell about that one. Go ahead. Yeah, how did that start? Well, that started with the first riff. And then the second riff. And that was like, the first two minutes of the song was like, yeah, fuck, this is how it should go. I heard it in my head and I just wrote it down and this is how it goes then at some point I remember I asked Ville do you have any lyrics I could I have this idea that we could have this sort of a chorus in this song uh, but uh, I've never tried the idea before maybe it could fit here maybe if you have some lyrics I could like uh, check it out what I could do for those and you know like give me a chorus man chorus lyrics and he wrote the thing that we're seeing in there a couple of times in the song. And the more I started to go, like, uh, I think, actually, yeah. Now, now I remember. It's about that uh, 
seven minute mark when the acoustic guitar starts. I had this idea, it resembled me a bit of thurfing. I don't know why, maybe it, it had some sort of thurfing vibe on it, those acoustic guitars. And the more I got to that part, the natural composing process started to slow down and the closer to I got to that part, it was a bit harder to like figure out how should I do it, what should I do, but I, managed to get there quite okay and I just couldn't I just couldn't go through that change the music in the album the music stops and the acoustic guitars start that's not how I make music that's not at all how I'm supposed to do it I told to myself and I just couldn't figure out any sort of way and I tried so hard, like I, I went there, I went past that part and I started to compose what comes after the acoustics and I'll get back to that later. Only to realize that I have no fucking clue how to get out from that part again. And I remember like I was fighting with that for like hours in a row. And at some point I felt that like I'm, I'm fucking losing it. I'm seriously losing it. I remember I was staring the computer screen and I was like almost in tears. Like this is, this is just fuck. I'm 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 actually gonna lose it right now. And I was supposed to go to the band rehearsals, and I still have no fucking any sort of memory. How did I end up to that band rehearsals? I remember one flashback from train station, but then I also remember a taxi. And yeah, mind you, I wasn't naturally drinking or anything. I was completely sober. And uh, I went to the band rehearsals and the guys asked me, Look, are, you, are you okay? You seem to be, you seem a bit weird and silent compared to me usually always talking a lot. Well, I've had some problems and I felt like I can't even fucking speak anymore. I don't know. I have become some sort of a mad. And it was just too much. I have been trying to fight fight with the song for like several days, and and then it was just like a couple of badly slept nights, and everything just fucking fell apart. In the end, I decided to go with that. The change when the acoustic starts, I can bear with that. It's tolerable. I'm used to it. But the weird part with only the keyboards suddenly stopping with this. It's still shit. I'm sorry, P man. I'm sorry, very sacket. I'm sorry, Moosoro. After 17 years, technically 18 years ago, done, it, I still think it's shit. I should have done better. But I don't still know what could I have done better. But here's a long story for that one song. I, I think you just described everybody's favorite part of that song. <laughs> like specific oh, to the moment like could not have better described exactly what everybody likes about that song we just oh, okay, um okay. don't worry i like when it hits the band yeah. scene that's definitely working i'm talking about the part where you oh, just right right the, with the, the acoustic the... and the it's beautiful i mean I th we just recorded us talking about how much we <laughs> love that part so it's really funny to hear it be like specifically the thing that you still dislike about that song 
Yeah, um, or maybe it's just the trauma that makes me think about <laughs> it that way. It could also be that. You never know. Are there other big songs that you still feel like like do you hate huto like what other classic songs that would be my next actually because huto is also like very liked by people but apparently not so much by the band because I, according to marco he said people just want to hear the beginning the tin to tin to tin to tin to tin And then the rest, according to Marco, the rest is useless. Yeah, yeah, but Marco just described what's exactly what's wrong with the song. That riff, that tee -nee 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 -nee, I'm really proud of it. It's fucking good riff. Yes, I can say of my own riff that some of them are really fucking good, and that was what it's one of the best riffs I've ever done. The problem is that there's not much of the rest of the song that like it's basically this good riff and the good melody is basically like it's it's carrying the wagon while the while the rest of the song is forgettable overly fucking long and consists of fucking four different songs really so like the problem with huto isn't necessarily the song in itself it's just that we went completely fucking overboard with their okay let's let's put this one riff there more maybe we should have this part here and Somebody should have told me that, you know, it's enough. Thank you. Let's just let's go to the fucking end and end this from its misery. You know, we don't need half of this song. There are good things. There are like other, other good things in, in Huto, which I personally like. Like ma many things and hooks and bits and pieces. But overall, it's just like uh, there's too much. Is that why Sudan 20 is so short? <laughs> You didn't want to double that one. What? Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Keep it going for five minutes straight with the same riff. Yeah, but imagine how good that would have been. Maybe if we take some sort of like more riffs of the same sort and stretch it to 15 minutes. Like, man, that would have sucked. That's, <laughs> that's, that's your new spark. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, thanks. Good. <laughs> no take it. Yeah, but that's basically what Huto is. It just wasn't made to be that long. Like mm. the nature of the song wasn't supposed to be that long that it became. And it got stuff with like futile parts, which fit the mood, the tempo and the key. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's put this one more here. No, shut the fuck up. Don't do it. Nobody told me not to do it. So here we are. I feel very stupid because it was the first Moonsoro song I've ever heard. And some years later, after changing my taste in music, I went back to it and I was like, it's still amazing. But apparently not. <laughs> no, but this is, this is why I basically dislike all these uh, ideas of taking somebody to tell about the music and the concept and like kind of a stripping it down naked in front of you hey let's talk honestly about these things because it takes the magic so badly away somebody can actually love some part of the song and then here comes the pompous asshole yeah i hate that part and well I, <laughs> no I like that part no because every time you listen to that part now you remember hey the guy said that it sucks and and that's bad in a way yeah, I totally hear what you're saying. I think that happens when you treat it as a, like, here's the way the song actually is. I think what we're interested in just, I mean, I don't know about the general audience, but we, the people in the room, have had such a relationship with these songs and this music for so long. And it's just really interesting to know what your relationship is with those songs too i mean i don't think for us it invalidates or changes really how we see it because a lot of it's basically out of your hands right i don't think you can say anything that'll make the last 15 years of loving a song like suddenly different now you're saying that it uh, kills the magic or whatever when i heard that uh, you don't like it and it's bad for all these reasons for me it's just 
Okay, that's your opinion. You're free to have your <laughs> bullshit opinion. Yeah, that's more like it. Appreciate yeah. that. That's not how it should go. When yeah. the music has flown away from my hands, it, it's yours now. It's everybody's now. It's not mine anymore. That's how I treat it. And that's how it should be. On that note, I'm curious, like, what are some of the Moon Sorrow moments that you, I don't know, pick three that um, you were saying that you really are proud of the main melody in Huto. What are some other Moon Sorrow moments that you still have like a strong uh, affection towards? Those like, uh, there's this one part in actually, because nothing is really that black and white. In Varjona album, there is this song called Muinaiset. And the last, let me actually, it's, it's easier for me to just dig the part from YouTube. No, it's that it's really fun how each of us speak of Munsoro music the same way. Every Munsoro song is It's like a me and Marcus, the keyboardist. We all always laugh about like you know the best song in the world is is just Every every single black metal song. It's not that black metal song. It's the other one, but, yeah. and we like uh, the triplet version better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nice Eight thirty. Okay. There is uh, like uh, raising like Tom and snare like raising. <laughs> That's one of my like top moments of Moonsoro's music. It's every time it gives gives me like this uh, like raises hair. I don't know the expression for English, but you know when you get like, goosebumps. Chills. Yeah, goosebumps, chills. Yeah, those. Yeah, exactly. That gives me that every time. I really like Villa's lyrics there and how he screams and it just it just fits really well. And ironically enough, many of those like goosebump moments for me in Moonsoro's music don't come from the music, but from like Ville's performance uh, combined with the music in a way, in a way that when Ville like nails it at some parts, that gives me the chills and like, wow, that was, ah, that's good. There is a, a running theme in our podcast that Ville gets better album after album to this day. Yeah, no, he only gets lazier and then he needs to be kicked and threatened. And then he... <laughs> is there another moment that stands out? So uh, that moment in Moon I Set, which now that I remember which part you're talking about is, yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's yeah, incredible. It in my opinion, really well. Yeah. But there are like many, many things, but from our, our, like from the top of my head, that's like one of the first things that I can remember like right now. But yeah, uh, no. I, I guess there are like, uh, I, I don't listen to our albums really actively, pretty much not mm -hmm. at all, which most likely doesn't surprise anyone in a way. But uh, <laughs> not that I don't like the music I've made, because, you know, when you have a band, you always want to make the music you like. So you better fucking like your own music, you know. Yeah. But uh, in in a way, I just don't want to like dwell in the past. I've always been going going forward, or most likely too often, too fast. But <laughs> nevertheless, I, I really like don't want to like look back what was better and what was done back then. And man, this was so good. Can we ever be this good? No, fuck no, dude. We're gonna be better. Fuck off. Don't listen to those albums. But there are like uh, many things that I really like and give me those chills. And but most of them are really they are really closely tied to lyrical and like vocal performances, mm -hmm. not music. Because even even though I might be really proud of something, like man, this 
this riff works really well. Man, did I get, make a good melody or oh, what? You know, I'm allowed to dig some of my own stuff. You know, I'm just a fucking human. But uh, it's not that I'm, I'm, I'm not waving there around. Hey, look at my riffs, man, they're good. But well, I can say it to myself in silence in a black chamber because I'm a fin Finnish and nobody needs to know that I'm proud of anything I've done. But uh, usually those are like very closely tied to the vocal performance because that really like makes it for me. I, I want to hear the same melan the, the same feeling, the same passion, the same yearning and this feeling that I want to pour to my music when I can hear it from a human mouth that just, you know, it's, it fucking tops it. You're saying how uh, you have to make music that you like and so that you better like what you do. And yet you just told us a moment ago that you're not so happy with Barrio I actually wonder why, it, well, it's not my favorite album, but the only album I would say I don't like that much is Sudanuni. All the others I really like to a bigger or lower extent, but it, it's interesting to see that you don't, especially when you made it when you were already experienced. It's not like the first album or whatever. What is it that you don't like that much about it? Uh, I think Mariana, uh, and as said, we loved it when we did it. It's just that sometime afterwards, we thought that maybe this was something that we just don't feel to be that much us than we thought it would be. And I think one of the problem in Barriona is that those songs in general, uh, it, it's actually like two aspects, basically. The first one is like more obvious in a way that the guitars are mixed way too loud. They're like basically eating everything out. And there's this constant <laughs> everywhere. And that kind of a strips down the magic and the nu nuances we're having usually. So that was like basic, it was arranging mistake and then production mistake, arranging in a way that I deliberately arranged every single instrument to play the way they do in order to achieve as massive sound going throughout the album all the time as possible. And then we wanted even to emphasize that on the mix. So just something that I feel that didn't work. It was done exactly how we wanted it to work. And I, I would never say that it's badly mixed album at all. Arthur oh, did a fucking wonderful job with that. There, there was like nothing wrong with that at the time. It's just that we later thought that maybe it's a bit too heavy in our standards and not something we would necessarily want to experiment again. And the other part, which is, might be not so obvious to, to like most of the people, but as a composer, I think that many of those songs could have been ha having like a bit better arrangements in a way. For example, that hold, we could have stripped a couple of minutes away from, you know, here and there. And it, it's not a bad album at all. It's most likely, it, it, it's okay, more sort of standards, but it's not like, a, it's a bit, for me, it's a bit like Sudanone. It's like album that we did, but doesn't necessarily represent us in a way that I would like us to be represented this day. I have one more question about uh, Variona. I was thinking about that uh, recently um, when I listened back to it. Uh, as a sound designer, you used a lot of um, footsteps in the snow mm -hmm. uh, on some parts. And I was wondering, was it something uh, you wanted to do uh, as an experiment or you listened to Phil's recording already at the time and you wanted to use it to convey the story in the lyrics or what did your mind behind those snow steps we can hear throughout the the entire album is it to lead the progression or some just for fun i don't know ah oh no it's uh, like uh, carrying the story on onwards okay uh, i also have like sound designer experience i did that for years in my previous job but uh, i've always loved the theatrical and the otherworldly like cinematic approach uh 
in in like for example in Bathory's albums and yeah. I'm a huge fucking fan of sound effects in like dramatic and music like music that tells a story if that's combined with sound effects that's like a fucking eargasm to me basically because I love immersion I, I fucking adore immersion and I love escapism and when you combine like story music that kind of carries the story and then the sound effects like whoa I'm there uh, and and that's why I always want to use sound effects in Moonsaro's albums. And the purpose of those m- like middle songs were to carry the songs uh, like from like kind of a they would be like transitional moments in a movie, so to say. And I actually yeah. drew pictures ab- for the guys that I want basically I want to depict these like pictures. There was this one picture like people walking down let me think about like uh, lord of the rings this refugee party going to helms deep that sort yeah. of a thing was in my mind that uh, women and children and everything is fucking shitty and we're in a hurry and we need to go and the next part is like well you can you know like go all fucking nuts with lord of the rings references here but you can <laughs> the next one in the snow is basically like you can think about it like guys running away uh, actually it slips me now which movie that was but running running away from something in somewhere but in snow basically and you're like you're you're going there and and you think that everything is okay and then you see that behind the line no that's not from lord of the rings it's up from somewhere else but anyway so let me start again part two the snowy steps the snowy steps. The idea of that is that uh, you have this the same people, the refugees that are going from place A to base, place B, still, and now they are in snow, and you're basically at the front of the big line of people, and you hear that there are wolves. You hear some like lonely wolves. Did I hear right? And then you realize that you heard right. You heard, heard another wolf. And if you listen carefully, a couple of more wolves appear in the back. And then you start to hear screaming and like general panic. It's really low mixed. And what happens then is that you're, you, the character, you start to speed up. You're not running, but you're like, like, hey, there's nothing wrong here. Let's just walk a bit faster. <coughs> shit man uh, is that sort of a, like to to like get this feeling of like spreading panic which is not complete panic yet but something is wrong and it's getting fucking wrong all the, more wrong all the time that was the idea of the second one okay that, that that works extremely well and i agree with you about uh for example battery with all those um uh, battles and fight sound effects with the swords sometimes yeah. taken from from movies um, from every single sample yeah. of always I, I, I know that with my with my friends making games we like to 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 compose with the, the idea that uh, we can mix um sound effects and music uh, because it's a game and it's meant to be interactive and so we have a some way to mix cool stuff there but for the snow part it's really it's really nice because it's it adds a very heavy weight feeling to the overall mood you don't run very fast in snow and and you should uh, make uh, the next album in surround <laughs> to really hear the walls behind your back <laughs> that could be a spark <laughs> the music would sound so shitty like <laughs> cool five point whatever Thing, and then you have the stereo mix of music. <laughs> Five point one music sounds like shit if, if it's not live. Yeah. Uh, from a, a technical point of view, um, how did you record? What did you record for the those parts, the footsteps? Uh, did, did you record everything? Did you take some sound from some banks? Uh, I think it was kind of a 50-50. I had a ton of my own stuff but then like some random you know i don't have any 
wolf recorded by myself. So, for example, those were like taken from somewhere else. Um, one of the exciting things about talking to you about Moon Sorrow is that I think in a lot of people's minds, Moon Sorrow is like Henry's band, like Henry is the main composer, Henry plays whatever. But in hearing you talk about it, uh, even in the stuff that you write yourself, you take a very, you kind of let the music um, write itself and you're not taking a very heavy handed approach. And in listening to the stuff, the parts that you're most touched by is other people's, is the parts that are outside of yourself. And one of the things that I don't think gets talked about with Moon Sorrow is that you've been, you know, since what, 95, you've been a band and, uh, you know, with uh, Voimasta, the full band that as it is now has come together. And that's been almost, I think it's been 20 years now. And so what, what is your perspective on what's made Moon Sorrow as a band and as a collective of people have such a healthy and long life? Well, that's really easy, actually. Uh, we are first and foremost, we are friends. A bunch of good friends, and we just happen to play in a band. And th that's a fucking blessing in this sort of a band activity stuff. It also means, though, that if you have quarrels with people, you actually need to be an adult and figure them out instead of getting somebody fired from the band because you can't do it because you're a fucking bunch of first friends first and foremost and not not just bandmates so but yeah this is something i I've, I've been told told my wife like for years and i've been told the guys that one of the best things in my life counting up every of everything else i have the opportunity to play in a band with my five best friends so, so that's like, a, I don't know, could I ask for more? Well, we are continuing in the same place with the same people, so not much more introduction is needed. And today we're going to start with a topic that Toma knows a lot about, and that is uh, the topic of video games. It would be a waste not to use the French guy we have here to talk about that other side of uh, Henry's work. So, Toma, <laughs> the stage is yours, as they say. Yep. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Henry, I just had that um, question in my mind for some time now. Uh, yesterday, we spoke uh, about uh, movies and uh, Brave Out, if I'm not mistaken, as the sound can end up into um, music for ambience and sound design stuff. As a musician, uh, you worked in Rovio, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Do you use any influence from video games? I don't know, for example, uh, if you play them, but uh, the old Zeldas or Castlevanias in Moonsoro for that sadness we were talking about and probably epic mood. Is it something you used on some Moonsoro um, music in the past or still today? I'd say that uh, the, the video game influences, I think it's more present in Pin Trolls music, more, more than in Moonsoro's. Uh, I think one of the things that I tend to pick up from video game music in general for everything I do is the sort of flowing of those uh, yeah. certain things like the, the mood. For example, if you take the Zelda games, 
I gotta say, I'm not a huge fan of Zelda game music. <laughs> I'm really sorry, everybody. But I, I've recently tried to get a grip on those. There are some good things, but I'm generally not really a great fan of Japanese, uh, like J- yeah. JRPG music. But basically the thing goes that for when it comes to these uh, like games that have like sort of an epic quality on it. And by epic, I don't necessarily mean that, oh, fuck, yeah, dragons. <laughs> and this chaotic action going on anywhere, e- everywhere in the game, audio and music. I'm talking bo- more about epic as in like vastness and with the mood you can even almost like smell from your screen yeah. and up like that. that. Those sort of things tend to leave an impression on me and... There might be some, I might compose something for Musoro that reminds me of, uh, let's say, something in an RPG, let's say some Baldur's Gate stuff or something. I'm pretty sure that if I start to dig up, there is a, there is an MP3 or WAV file that has been named as whatever <laughs> Baldur or something. And that's probably because I've been thinking some. It reminded me of something in that game that gave the riff that name. And so basically, I'm not taking like direct influences from anything, but as a gamer, of course, it's affecting me into my own creative work. That's, of course, it has to go that way. Because we were, I think it was on Pimea, we were talking about the... um the the way the two parts are connected and mm-hmm. for example in my work with video games i don't work a lot with music but sometimes i have to adapt the music to make it interact- interactive so i'm using wise or f mod but well, though... don't don't get to the wise discussion here i'm supposed <laughs> to learn it i've been supposed to learn it for a year and we've come to the point where my boss is actually offering me race if I take the course and <laughs> fucking pass it because he's so frustrated because I don't want to do it. But that, that that's really hard for me as well to have the music sounding great for an interactive piece as a video games. And I think that that was my my question. <laughs> <laughs> On the note of the interactivity of video game music, one video game composer who I think I'm on Twitter. I follow you on Twitter. I think I saw you retweet or something. Austin Wintry, he he made the soundtrack for Journey. Yeah. And I don't know how much of the video game work, music work that you do involves this, but one of the interesting things about that game is it's a it's a score, but it's in like sections that can loop indefinitely and then like transition into something as the player moves or does like a certain action. Right. And I think you talked a lot about flow in being like important in moon sorrows sound. And I wonder like, is there an overlap between like how you would approach a moon sorrow song and how a video game composer might approach that type of songwriting type, that type of composing for something that can kind of, exist in a certain space over and over without getting too repetitive but still be able to transition smoothly into something else uh there's actually a good example of this uh, one of my colleagues at work he's really wi- wizard on wise and he worked earlier at remedy games no no like such games as max Payne and whatever all sorts of alan wakes and the new one, Quantum, something which I can't remember. Anyway, uh, Mikko gave me, gave me a showcase. Uh, he had used Poets of the Falls music in one of the special stages on Max Payne. Was it Max Payne? Anyway, in some of those Remedy, like AA, AAA games. And he showed me how the music was built basically from one one song that I think it was like six minutes or something in total, like the, the single version, but they could stretch it until fucking 30 minutes within this voice engine. And they had all sorts of like uh, variated, like variations for drum fills, uh, which you could basically launch in a way that you can uh, like, of course, everything was like beat synced. 
So you could have you could start with a different drum fill on top of some break and then go to another place. Like from that drum fill, you could already already take like eight different places where you could go. And then you can layer a guitar solo from one to seven on top of those. Or it was it was like so it was like the fucking London metro system. It was so complex and weird and amazing what you can do technically with one song only. Of course, they had recorded it that in mind. So they had had a lot of different takes. And I think Nico said to me that they had like oh, 200 files or something, which of, of which the song was basically pull, pulled together in the game so that when you actually enter a room with that boss, you're getting like a guitar solo and like total rock and roll. And when you leave the room, you'll get a, like this uh, easier part. And uh, technically, I think a Moonsorrow song could be could be snapped to being adaptive. We have so many different parts in our songs. Like, it's not that our one song, it's the fast song, and then there is the slow song, and then there is this acoustic song. Our songs are so fucking long, and they tend to have a lot of different, like, things. They are like mini songs within songs. So those could actually be snipped really easily, given that we would have those multi-tracks. Because, of course, there's this one really crucial thing on game music and its adaptivity, it, it, which is the tales. All those, when, when you cut the music, you should hear the natural decay of everything, like the cymbals and, and reverb tales and everything. If you just chop it like, it sounds completely fucking, well, you know how it sounds. So technically you need to include for every single transition from place A to place B, you need to have the tail of that place E within that file. Otherwise, it's just going to work horribly. But given that we would have those tails, we could easily build the same sort of thing for Moon Sorrow as well. And in terms of building a Moon Sorrow song, we're going to talk in a little bit about like more specifics maybe per album. But generally speaking, <laughs> let's say you have an idea for a Moon Sorrow song that you're working on. Uh, you demo it out and you like do program drums. Like, what do you like? What does the first version of a Moon Sorrow song look like in terms of your workflow? We have, or I, I've been having like doing this for, I don't know, 15 years at least, the three stages of music. First is what we refer as shit demo. We call it literally shit demo, Pasca demo in Finnish. And that means that it's like uh, it might have like playing mistakes. Nothing is like thought out super well or anything. But it's it's something that if you would play it in the background, like without paying any attention, it would sound like a song still. So mm -hmm. it's it has like okay-ish sound, and you can definitely understand what's going on. And after that's been like uh, that's more like this. Uh, creative side of me working in a way that uh, that's something that I just do and pour and basically just open the the tap to like just flush everything out and I, I'm not thinking much when I compose I'm I'm going with the flow because uh, that's really important for me and those demos are mostly you playing 100 percent okay and so you, you, oh, uh, do you, we've talked a little bit, like you, I don't know if you still do this, do the drums on a keyboard? Fuck yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I do it with keyboard and not like pads. I, I have pads. I, I just can't. It, it's, yeah. I've been doing this since the mid 90s. Not even, I think early 90s, like 92 or something with my fingers, like in these, I, oh yeah, you, you can't see my keyboard. It, it's right here. But, uh, but, but yeah, I, I can't use the pads. They, they feel weird and awkward. Yeah, and you don't want to edit the MIDI. I guess that would take way too long. If you're already I really know. good at... I, I do what they call, uh, if you're familiar with the concept of quantizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's um, that I'm usually doing for those. 
Okay. Sometimes I'm really fucking lazy and not don't do it. But usually at the point when I want to uh, like when I'm like in a rush, that I need to get this out of my system before I forget it. Then you know, fuck quantizing. And uh, everybody can understand what I'm trying to do. But uh, but uh, when I want to present that to the band members, like, hey, here are some ideas I've been working for. I'm going to quantize the drums because I know that everybody's going to, I, I, it's hard to follow because the drums are so weird. Yeah, of course, they're fucking weird. So that's why I just want to make it a, a bit more cleaner for them. But that's the shit they all face. I find it funny that uh, you say that uh, using patches is weird, but playing drums on a keyboard is not weird at all. It's the most important <laughs> thing in the world. It's the way of mysticum. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm a keyboardist, so that should probably explain a lot. Well, and that's something that I have wondered too. Did you start playing music through keyboard, piano? Yeah, I started piano lessons before I was four years old. So I've been playing pretty much for 40 years now. And as a composer, obviously, like that side of thing is so like, um, sort of made to be imagined on a keyboard. So when you approach a Moon Sorrow song, even though you are ostensibly the guitarist, do you think in terms of guitar? Do you think in terms of keyboard? Do you write on a guitar? Do you write on a, is it a mixture? I think I write with my brain. I don't uh, like, I, I know many people would grab an instrument and play along, you know, having these ideas, maybe, maybe something like this. Maybe I could, maybe, oh yeah, this sounds a bit better. Maybe here and trying things out. I don't do that at all. I, I do like, uh, I have this like blessing and a curse. I didn't really order it from anyone when I was born, but I got this thing called absolute pitch, perfect pitch known as well and that's uh, like a godsend in these kind of things because when i hear something it's i just can can do it right away and it's 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 basically that i hear i hear a lot of things i hear a lot of voices in my head so to say that uh, uh, I, I just basically just need need something to make out the vision like uh, to 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 actually make it happen so that it's heard somewhere else than in my head but i usually have a very very like i hear the whole band so to say already in my head and uh i i, I do also like uh, it's actually a funny thing when i hear melodies or like think melodies you know how people get ideas that that i'm talking about that when i get ideas i don't think about like technically uh, like any instruments at all i just hear the thing in my head just like a writer would hear the sentence in his head but whenever i hear a guitar riff uh my brain goes instantly I, i see a guitar and i can feel basically my fingers moving in that fretboard to do exactly what how it should be played so that's really weird every other thing in my head when when i compose i don't think about the instruments i just hear them but whenever there's a guitar riff i see the guitar and i do actually this like air guitar fingering thing I don't know why. There's something I uh, always um, wondered. When you compose in your head, do you think about all, every instrument that will be in the final song? Or do you experiment a bit uh, when you are recording and mixing the, the final song? Actually, it's a good question in a way that we are now going back to the demo phase. Because after these shit demos, there is there is a proper demo and that's basically what you are hearing in the album just with a different sound so i arrange like of course it's not going like that i'm arranging every single thing and nobody can say a shit but the thing is that i do arrange every single version of the songs for every single instrument after that everything is debatable discussable and whatever but I do the first versions myself. And those are the final versions when I've actually thought out like every single fucking note there is. And basically, if nobody wants to change anything, they are just basically just doing the same thing again, what I did at home. I send the guys like tracks, okay, 
because you like the the sheet demos and we've agreed that let's polish those and let's do the final demos from those versions. And then I arrange everybody's instruments for real and send them the rehearsal tracks. Go nuts, rehearse these before we go to the rehearsal place and see you there. And then we can start discussing about like, if somebody thinks that maybe we want to change like this one position from bass to another one or like play this one octave lower or something, but yeah, but the, I went back to the demo phase and now you need to rephrase the question again. So I remember why I went to those demos. I asked if you, you planned every instrument beforehand or just experimented uh, during oh, the, re yeah. the recording phase. Yeah, so I do plan everything ahead, but that's also a really good thing in a way because that leaves us that room for experimenting if we want to. And that's really important that we we never, we've never done that and we will never will. We are not going to the studio to experiment because we have no idea what to do. We go to the studio, we have everything, everybody knows exactly every single fucking note they are supposed to play and how they are supposed to play it. And because of that, uh, and because of rehearsing, that leaves us the leeway to actually experiment and try different things out. Or well, not necessarily try because we tried those already in the rehearsal room before the studio when we rehearse practice together. But uh, let's say that somebody finds a really weird instrument in the studio. Hey, this could really nicely fit to place X in song Z. And now we have time to try it out because we've been pre-producing ourselves to hell and back before. If, if that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. But also the way with the Fintro in the studio, because I've, all your studio diaries are usually Fintro-ish and not, I, I, I mean, for me, I'm not in any way a machine, so I, I cannot understand anything you're talking about. But to me, it sounds like that in Fintro, it's not the same way with the rehearsing of the demos and going straight in and we know exactly what to record. Well, both bands operate basically the exact same way. They are sheet demos, then they are polished demos, then they are rehearsal tracks for everybody. Rehearse that, catch you at the practice room one month from this date. Uh, but with Fintrol, it's a bit different thing. Uh, there are some uh, differences between the rehearsing in general and the band being really scattered around Europe, basically. So it's not that it's not the same that with Mozart, which is as a band, it's, it's much more cohesive co in, in, in a way. It's much more easier to to put the Mozart guys into a one place and discuss and rehearse with Fintro, it's much more harder. Otherwise, the methods are the same until one month before the studio. And that's that's where the differences start to accumulate to different directions. I wanted to ask a couple of questions concerning what you said before. Actually, two. So one of them is you said that you write your demos, then you go to the rehearsal room, and then you test new things. And I wonder when you have a thousand layers on in each song, in in a way that when you are going to play live, you have to rearrange them for them to be possible to play by five people. Mm -hmm. and in those rehearsals, I, I wonder how you try those new things or new layers if you are just five people. Uh, well, I think one of the biggest issues there, it's the fucking tone of synths. And like, if you if you would take, if you would strip all the synths from Moonsaro, that would be already like, 75% of all the layers. Then there would be like acoustic guitars and the extra choir vocals. And the choir vocals, we can, you know, but strip those away and it's a rock and roll band, like in, in its all simplicity. But uh, yeah, the vocals, like, yeah, check, we can do those. We are many people. Uh, acoustic guitars, yeah, not, not can, no can do. 
we'll use just you know clean guitar sounds instead, clean electric guitar, no distortion. But the most of the task and the job basically falls directly to Markus shoulders and he does a fucking super wonderful job with every single album he just gets better and better with everything like year after year and he has an ama- amazing like moral he has this ambition to make it sound like it sounds in the album and it, it really shows shows when he does that so a huge kudos to Markus on that one. He's one of the biggest reasons why we are able to sound even near what we are sounding live compared to studio albums. And actually, this is excellent that you said this because it takes me to the next question that I had, which is you make, okay, the first the shit demo is 100% you. The second, as I understood, is pretty much the same, also done by you. Yeah. And... Okay, leaving aside the ones that, uh, because I, if I understand right, Marco sometimes writes half of a song or most of a song, but leaving those aside, the ones that are credited to you, how much and in what way do the others contribute? Mm, well, let's say that no song has ever passed a recording phase in this band without everybody approving it. Yeah, approving so, for sure, approving for sure. But yeah. as, in, as in adding something, how does that work? Well, it's it's really hard to say. I, I, I would love, I would kind of phrase it in a way that not necessarily everybody is bringing musical contribution to those sessions where we are molding the songs and when we are like discussing about what we like, what we don't like, what works and what doesn't. There may be situations where musical ideas being thrown to the table do do actually more harm to the overall atmosphere than when there is a situation that another person may just have the great spirit, bringing a really great spirit to those sessions with him and contributing in that sense even more to the actual final product. So it's it's a double-edged, or like a two-sided answer, really. People do uh, contribute each on their own ways. Everybody in this band have contributed musically, and everybody in this band has also contributed like spiritually. But for me... I think it's a combination of both. And we have had, well, not, not necessarily with Musoro that often, but I've had situations when I've been composing music with people and the overall atmosphere has been shit. And even though the musical approach somebody throws to the table might be interesting and might prove my ideas to be wrong in a way that we will change it according to his plan because it just is better. It doesn't necessarily mean that the overall atmosphere is good and the spiritual feeling is there. And to be honest, I think it's like a 50-50. There can't be, there has to be both. Equal amount of both to make things actually work. So I, I would like to raise up the to bring up more about that spiritual mutuality and the, the <laughs> good vibes in that process. That's really important for me. And additionally, a teeny tiny question out of curiosity. The, are the guitar solos your thing or Mitya's thing? Or it depends? Mitya, definitely. No, I'm not a solo guitarist. I'm definitely a rhythm guitaristic. Gu- guitaristic. Uh, Mitya is the, is the solo guy and He's always been like this slayer dude. And I know that even though he would never admit it, but uh, I, I know that he would love to play solos even more because he's more like a traditional guitarist. I tried to be the traditional guitarist when I was like 16, 17. And I realized with this bunch of dicks, it's impossible to play anything fast. So I just started to concentrate on what I do better, which is like crunching the shit out of the guitar as a rhythm guitarist. And I really like that. It's like it's been my slot always in this band, and I really enjoy it. 
So the solos we hear in the in the studio albums are his creation, right? His creation, 100%. He's always given like completely free hands, except <laughs> we had really, really, really hard time to swallow the Kualed Ma guitar solo with this fucking video game tapping and whatever. We're like, man, man, this is, I don't, are you fucking sure about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's fucking awesome. Don't be such a pussy. Okay, well, it's your solo, but you you know, it, if it would actually destroy the mood of the song in a way that I would have it, like, consider it unacceptable, I would have, at that point, call on the veto card. And yeah, sorry. I, I'm really sorry, but we can't. But it, it was on the verge, but it didn't cross the line, so it was there. I remember seeing a video probably on Facebook or something of of that session and you behind the controls while he was recording and you started saying what is this video game pew, pew, pew. <laughs> I can't remember that yeah there is a video yeah, somewhere I can just imagine how horrible it must be if if the spiritual essence wasn't there in the demo phase like you bring everything to the table and you're like, how do you like this? And everyone's just, no need, good, okay. But the spiritual feeling is not there. It's just puppets just bowing down and say, yeah, go for it. Like you, I can imagine you probably want some sort of yes, but uh, questions. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if everything was just yes, you're like, what the fuck? What now? <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, like I always, well, it's like a, I think everybody in the in, playing in a band says the same thing. We'd rather like like everybody else. We'd rather get like for, for a score in a review. We get rather one than we would get three. We're talking about one to five scale. Yeah. Because three is just so. Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> mediocrity is just like. <laughs> the, thank you. I've completely fucking blew it. Like no no comment. <laughs> Yeah, I'd rather get one yeah. out of five any day than three. It's not uh, constructive in any way. So yeah, so in that yeah. case, it's exactly what you how you just described it. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. No, that's you not go what ahead. I want to hear. <laughs> yeah, for nothing, man. <laughs> I worked my but ass off, and this is what I get. <laughs> yeah, but. As a flip side, as things are not so black and white, I remember struggling a great deal with this uh, Ruttolehto song. Mm. And just two days before the studio start was going to start, I sent another version for the band. Like, okay, here's now a 15-minute version of the song, like 12-minute version of the song. And uh, yeah, it's a bit different. I wanted to go more black metal. I didn't like the song as, as it was now. And the guys were like, okay, dude, seriously. This must be the fucking 25th version you send to us. And every every time <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, this is now better. And then you say the next day, no, it wasn't better. We are not going to even to listen to this anymore. <laughs> and we are going to record the final version as it was. <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, retrospectively we're thinking, man, though, those guys were so right. But, you know, my point is that Sometimes I go completely overboard with the nate picking and with the vision, like a TM on bra brazers, brazers. Yeah. Well, <laughs> shift eight. And uh, yeah, so sometimes, uh, especially with you, Maldonado, I went went to the dark side a bit too often and like was like banging my head to the keyboard like. I have no idea what to do because I have too many options. 
and that was the plague of that album. And we've promised to each other that we will never, ever do an album in that way again. Well, that makes it fun to see what's going to happen in the next whoever knows how many years. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's actually a really good transition into uh, part of what we wanted to ask about in today's interview, which is basically the process of each album. So I don't know where we would want to start, but I'd be curious to ask about like Tommy Queen and Talvi. Like, do you remember going into making that demo? Um, was it recorded with the intention of being a demo? Or was it recorded with the intention of being the debut? Yeah, I, I remember it like like it was yesterday. But I have so like the particular time in my life was a time of I don't know. Sounds a bit cheesy, but kind of a great enlightenment in a way that I kind of knew what I wanted to do, like musically, spiritually, and and uh, when I was doing that demo, like we we need to go back to the meta demo quickly. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna no, dwell in please. meta demo. Uh, and the time before that. When we started to do with stuff with Villa, we never did anything serious. Everything was basically just like tongue-in-cheek, bullshit, joke versions out of the real stuff. <laughs> Because we we thought that it was kind of a, like this uh, like disguise for us in a way we we didn't dare to enter the big boys playground so we stayed in our own and yeah we're just making these joke versions because then we can kind of do the music we like but you know we don't have to expose ourselves to to even to ourselves yeah. and then the meta demo was like. I was thinking like, oh yeah, well, hey, this sounds like Anslav. Let's do some Anslav stuff. Hooray, pagans! And then I started to like dwell more on the subject. And oh, man, this stuff is fucking fascinating. And then then I just went completely nuts. And I started to like check out books. And the internet was was not the same internet it was. It, it's nowadays in like ninety six, ninety seven, but. The things I, I I like I printed some like I I actually printed pages of Edda out and interpretation fuck I can't even say the word but you know like de deciphering that basically mm -hmm. and the nine noble virtues and oh, holy fucking shit what is this this is exactly what I believe in and I was so like what what it first doing a couple of riffs first. It, it started for me as a as an idea that hey let's do some insulin this shit and it it didn't take long that the, the that shit was doing me instead and I was just like a follower anymore like well I this is like fucking awesome and at the first time ever in my life I felt that this is not a joke project at all and I'm actually fucking dead serious with that okay I did some things uh, like, for example, we took, like, we had some, like, dim we, we stole the intro battle sounds from Demoniac's album. And because we thought that, yeah, well, you know, it's a joke stuff and nobody gives a shit. But it didn't feel a joke anymore at that point. But I had to have some sort of, like, a, like this cre credible disguise to myself in a way that, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing serious stuff. I'm just, you know, fooling around. And one part of me is, you're doing serious stuff. No, man. No, I'm not. I'm using demoniac sub. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm sorry. And then I started to do really serious stuff. And then we go to Tamai Kun and Tawi, which for me at that point was the culmination of everything in, in a sense that I had got better musical gear. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And I knew what I 
kind of a spiritual. It belonged to what was my. It felt like I was about in my twenties. I felt like I fucking found my destiny. The sky is the limit. Your Valhalla is the limit, kind of a way. You know, fuck the world. So when I started to do that, the Tama Ikunen Talvi demo, it was meant as a demo all the time. We never thought about it as a debut album. But with a twist, we had one thing, or, well, I can't speak for Ville, like 100%, but I can speak for myself. Fucking sue me for this. One of the things I did it, or I wanted to do it so well as I could was because I thought there are so many shitty albums already released. You know, as a pretentious 20-year-old who, who like thinks that the, the world yeah. is his oyster, you know, fuck you, everybody. I'm going to present you a better demo that your shitty albums haven't even, they don't have a chance to compete with. Well, it's not the true truth, actually. There are many albums that can compete with that, but, you know, that was my, like, the backbone of the idea. That was your mindset. Yeah. Do you remember writing the melody at the end of Luopion Veri? If I'm saying that right. Yeah. Which one? The last melody. Da ba da ba da 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 da, and the double cakes come in. To me, that it seems like a very trademark Moon Sorrow moment, and it uh, it's one of the earlier parts of the discography that I can remember hearing it. Do you remember where that came from? What the inspiration was? Yep, and that's why I'm actually laughing here because you say that it, it's like a Moon Sorrow thing. For me, the first thing that pops to my mind when you started to humming it is Warcraft Two. <laughs> I've taken from Warcraft 2 and yes obviously it seems that I've taken taken some video game influences for this band as well but the thing is that it it's always reminded me a bit of Warcraft 2 but the truth is that actually it, it owes a lot to this Norwegian band called Obtained Enslavement the whole song basically reeks of Obtained Enslavement in a way mm. We are skipping Thorns of Ice and Promo, which, all right, were not released, but they were written and recorded. So how do those fit in the picture? Because I, as if I have the timeline right, first was Thorns of Ice, then Metza, then the Promo, and then Tamikin mm -hmm. and Talvi. So they are like in the middle. Inter yeah, Thorns of Ice was basically just one of those, hey, <laughs> let's do some shit. There was one good song, and as the story goes, and which is the absolute fucking truth, is that th that good song got destroyed. And we didn't bother to release that bad song, which is now released on the vinyl version, though. But but yeah, that was still that, that like, we're not really serious era. And the promo 97 was super serious. But it's, well, I think that was released in that vinyl box as well. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah, you did. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, it's fucking, it's, it's fucking like Air Slave and Emperor all over with the horrible sound. But yeah, that was like a that, that was serious approach. Even more serious than Metsa, but, but like musically so unworthy in, in very, in, in, in kind of all, all aspects that I don't, I don't, I don't talk about those much. They don't bring like, they don't bring anything meaningful to the discography in a way. There's a reason why they weren't like posthumously released in a seven inch or whatever until now. They're just not so, they're just not so good. Have you actually found what the parts which are not released on the box? What? So uh, on the big vinyl box, there is half of Thrones of Ice and I think the whole promo, which is just an intro and, and a song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did the remasters for all, but it's like 
I don't know, almost 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, what is lost from Torres of Ice is still lost, right? I mean, you haven't yeah, found anything yeah. afterwards. Okay. Yeah, there is. there was two copies of that tape and the mine got destroyed and I tried to hunt, hunt the other down for years from my ex-music teacher. Uh, well, like music co course teacher uh, in high school. Uh, <laughs> I passed one course uh, just like we were supposed to record something. And it was like a basic like AV course, audiovisual stuff. And But mostly in, in that case, it was like mixing, mixing and recording course. And because I was a lazy bastard already at the time, I just told him that, hey, I've recorded a lot of stuff. What if I just bring you something what I've done before? And can, can I now pass this course? And yeah, okay, bring me that tape. And then he, he I remember he taped that to his like collection of, yes, we used cassettes at the time. So he had a double like two deck cassette player and he dubbed that after the previous participants work so he can then judge the recordings later at his home. And I tried to hunt down that particular tape. I remember you taping it from me. Like, do you have it anywhere? I, I don't have any copies of that. And uh, he, he never, like, he was a busy man. He never either bothered or to find it or just didn't find it or didn't give a shit. But I don't, I don't think he has it anymore at this point. So I think it's like officially lost now. Sounds like we should do some kind of signature uh, online <laughs> signature Ooh. gathering and an online petition. One of, yeah, online petition with a witch hunt to find with his name and his address. <laughs> yeah, I still don't remember those two. It, it was based on two riffs, basically. And I, I still remember both of the riffs really well. So it mm. could be technically possible that we so recorded do the but... Breathing Blood. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but, but seriously, <laughs> like two riffs for what eight minutes. Mm. And I actually, when I found my four tracker tape, like these uh, tracker tapes, well, five, six years ago, I actually went through of every single of those trying to find that fucking song because it was done in that four tracker. And I, I had like a bunch, like a load of tapes, which I just circled you know i make a one project in this one and then when i filled up everything else i start to like go over the old ones again and reuse them recircle and uh, i went through all the tapes to find out that if if it could possibly be what in one of those tapes there was a lot of shit but there wasn't that particular song so that's lost for good so picking up kind of after Tama Ikuin and Talvi, when you were writing Sudan Uni, did you were you already signed? Did you know that it was gonna be a studio album or did you write the music and then it got picked up by a label or something? Uh no, we we did the traditional way and we sent or we Villa did all the work. So Villa sent the, the tape for like, uh, I don't know, maybe 30, 30 record labels or something. And if I remember right, we got two offers. We got Hammerheart, but not the Dutch one, but the Korean one, who also released the Dark Woods, My Bit uh, debut album back in 95. And, and then, then we got this uh, Plasmatica records. And because because Sweden, that was so such much e easier to pick it up, and I don't. That we had like half a song ready when we had the email that hey, I could sign you guys. Well, well, okay, well we should better start doing something. Well, and at that point, you're now a signed band, right? I, I, the exactly what you're talking about earlier with like hiding behind the humor and stuff is something yeah. that. I think a lot of us who have made music can really relate to, but at this point you're a signed band, so you don't really get to do that exactly, right? It's, um, or maybe to some degree you can, but the idea is that you now know you're working on your debut album 
and you at the same time decide to do a very different approach to the music um very different than in theory the demo that got you signed like what where were you where were you at what were you thinking leading into Sudan Uni and changing so much of the music we didn't to be honest we we didn't think it at all it was just like it felt so natural that okay we've done that now and you know like oh my god battery and here we go <laughs> So it just felt very natural and we didn't even think about that. Hey, we might have fans or we have expectations for the record company. We were just fucking naive and thought that now that we have a record deal, we can do whatever we want. So we didn't stop for a second to think that there might be a chance that people are not expecting anything like that. And that occurred us later, like in the studio, in the studio, like, uh, oh yeah, guys, by the way, this does sound a bit different than the demo, does it? Yeah, well, the demo is much more worse than this. That's true, man. Let's keep this. And that, that was the discussion. You mentioned earlier that a lot of the albums have like this little like germ of an idea musically that expands into kind of the sound of the whole album. Do you remember where the sound of Sudan Uni grew out of? You mean like uh, the sound uh, like uh, production wise? Or either way, wise. either the production wise or the um, decision to kind of be more mid tempo, bring in all of the folk instruments. Do you remember like what you made that you thought like, okay, that's what I want the album to kind of be centered around? Yeah, you mentioned that sometimes everything stems from one riff, for example, and from then, yeah. like you said, it opens the tap and everything flows. So, what was the spark in in Sudanuni? Uh, the opening riff of Queenie Kuna. That was the first riff done for Sudan Uni and the first song done for Sudan Uni. Mm. Followed up, after that, followed by Ukko Sajumalan Polk. So uh, there's a, like, uh, I do remember a lot of those like moments because they are really important in the big picture for me to like, I, I know where stuff starts from usually and I can pinpoint easily those like uh, sparks for each album. What, what happened first and so forth. Did including all of the folk and acoustic instruments feel like something that you had wanted to do and now you had the means to do? Or did it feel like something that you just had wanted to start trying then? Uh, basically, I could answer this in like two ways. First of all, when Tamai Kuna Talvi was done, it was basically, as I told there was this like personal ambition to fuck off everybody and the friends. And also it was the first time that I actually got this huge palette of sounds in front of me. And, and as a keyboard player, uh, like I went completely fucking nuts and I really wanted to like take advantage of all these incredible sounds that I could now use especially compared to like Metsa demo with the sounds. Then, then when that route was kind of already, we, we, we took the car and we drove it to pieces, basically. And there, there was nothing more we could anymore do with, with the music of Tama Ikun and Talvi. It was so over the top, like so many layers of synths and everything going on that, that we just thought that, okay, yeah, we do like layering stuff. We do like complex stuff. Maybe we should try another way to do complex stuff. And then because we had already flirted a lot with folk music and all these pagan themes, we thought that like it was a natural thing, kind of. A, okay, so our tempos have helped. How are we now going to fill that mass of stuff we want you, we want to fill again well that's fucking easy folk instruments acoustic guitars and that's basically just where people see a rock and roll band we see an empty space which could be filled with anything and depending on the tempo we just figured out that we just use another filling of to that cake 
so to say. Does that answer your question? Totally. Great. It's interesting that you mentioned that the first, the, the spark for the for Sudan Uni was the re initial riff in Queen Equinon. So I suppose it's a. No, not that. Not the first. So the very, very first. Yeah. Okay. Then, well, <laughs> I wanted to say that that second riff actually is the second, yeah. Reminded me a bit of the main riff in the lost song, this Vasaran Viha. Sorry, my bad. I meant Battle Him from Promo 97. which kind of reminds me a bit of Amorphis at the same time. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it's a bit like, uh, I don't know, the, it's a nursery rhyme, but uh, there, there's an English phrase for that. It's like uh, talking about small circles. And like uh, everything basically leading always to, to the back. Uh, around? To the side again. Oh, yeah. Well, around. But I, I'm referring to there is a phrase in Finnish called piiri pieni pyöri, which is like uh, the, the ends of the circles keep meeting and keep just circling all the time. And I, I'm pretty sure that there is an English equivalent for that phrase. Like that the I snake biting its point. tail or something biting its tail? Yeah, something like that. But the Finnish version is more about kids holding their hands. So that snake is a bit more brutal version of that. <laughs> but anyway. So after Sudan Uni, you did Voimasta. And yesterday when you were talking about the first two albums, you know, you said you still like them, that there's still things that you really appreciate about them. But I think you insinuated that they kind of have a, a sound that feels a little bit more aged than maybe some of the later stuff. Um, when we were talking about it, we talked a lot about the whole Finnish scene in general at that time. And, you know, you had like, well, it's, it's hard to, as an outsider and looking back at just the dates on the albums, keep in mind, like, where was Ensiferum? What were they doing? Where were, what was Corpor Klani doing at this time? So I guess, my question is going into Boymasta, what was the Finnish scene? Like, were you, what was your relationship with these other bands? What was the influence of the general Finnish music scene on that album? And maybe even Sudanuni, but on you at that time? Uh, there, there really wasn't a scene in a way that uh, there was a bar, there was a metal bar. And I dare to say that uh, it's the equivalent of, uh, if you've heard the Norwegian, the Elm Street bar in Oslo. Well, that was the Elm Street of Helsinki, basically, that bar. What's its name? Corner bar. Corner, as you know, corner. Okay. And uh, everybody was there. But it wasn't like a show-off place. It wasn't like, hey, let's go to show off at corner because everybody's in there. No. Everybody just happened to be there because it was the best fucking metal bar around. And they had cheap drinks and DJs were our friends. So we could always like harass them. Hey, put some battery, put some cannibal corpse. Enough with this shit, man. And we were always laughing about these trendy clowns. Like because three quarters of the, of the bar knew each other. Everybody knew each other. And then when outsiders came, they were usually either greeted or laughed out, depending on their attitude. But it was really, really like uh, this our circle, get get off from our bar, you know, this is our scene. But everybody was in that bar. Just where... Is that where Finnish folk metal mafia started? No, I think that was in some tour somebody invented that. I'm not still sure what I think of it. <laughs> but uh, at that point, like... Uh, well, at least like I can speak for myself and the other Musaro guys, 
we were like friends with Enziferum guys, but not not because we were playing with a band. We were just, you know, we were a bunch of guys that happened to play in bands. And technically, it, it could have been possible that I could had played in Enziferum or Mahi could have played in Moonsoro. It's just like coincidence, basically, that things went as they are now. When you think of Finland in the, you know, early to mid 2000s and since having this scene of folk metal and all of that stuff, do you attribute that more to a series of musical influences like this band started doing this and then other bands were influenced by that or do you think that it's something that was maybe more inherent to the musical upbringing of people that age in finland at that time kind of more similar to what you were describing to us yesterday about like the progressive and folk influences in the 70s is it more that everybody kind of had the same idea or do you think of it more in terms of well first this band started doing this and that became really popular and spread that way i think that it's really hard to say because i can't take for example mahi from enziferum and tell exactly why he likes folk music in general Mm -hmm. but uh, i know for a fact that mahi has said in many many interviews which he doesn't hide at all that for he, like the biggest thing was Amorphis. And, and and they did sound a lot like Amorphis in those demo days. Just like we sounded like a lot like Enslaved in our demo days. So it's not like a bad thing at all. It's just that you take whatever gave you that first spark and, and, and you start to fucking copy it because that's how things go. And then you start to realize that, hey, maybe I could pull something of my own up too. At that point, Enziperum, doesn't become an amorphous clone but shoots to the stars with their own stuff and at the same time moon sort of decides yeah we're not gonna stay like Enslaved. let's rip off battery instead and we go there well that's the next question so where so you went into uh the second album and you are now much more of a battery sound do you remember what led to that or what may be that first spark in voimasta Volmasta was a bit weird session, like oh, like it, it was a weird album in a way. That uh, first of all, we booked the studio because Ahti at Tiko Tiko Studio, he was really busy man at the time, and uh, we needed to book the the second album recordings when we left Kemi with Sudanle. So let's dig up the calendar, and it seems that you have okay one and a half years from now. We booked at August 2001, it, it, and, and, and we booked that. We thought that, of course, we're going to like have another record deal. This is a good good album we have done. So why wouldn't we get like a, an option to do another one? When then she hit the fan and Plasmatica Records went down, and it, it was like late spring and summer approaching, and we had booked the studio, and we still didn't have a record deal. So Marco negotiated us a, a deal from Spike Farm with Summit Tenets, and I was really opposing that. It took me that, what, one month to pursue it, and then like two weeks before the studio, I, 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 I was agreed to, to ink the deal and so, so that I could save the studio and the band, because the next studio was already like we would have to wait one and a half years again to get to Tico Tico, and we wanted really there. And uh, we went there and it was really like scattered session. I remember like I had uh, like Fintro gigs. I had to go to Wacken in the middle of the sessions and then come back and then leave to some other gig with Fintro because like the Fintro stuff but was really, really like started to get on on fire. Like, uh, well, you get the point, like in, in, a, in a race in a way that it started to interest people. And we suddenly got this gig in Wacken and we were supposed to do another gig in Wacken. And I was like bouncing around between Helsinki and Kemi. And from Helsinki, I, I don't remember where did I fly, a couple of flights. And then back to Kemi again, like 5 a.m. And, and left, uh, airplane. And it was fucking, can't remember half of that session. Mitya played some of his guitars 
when I wasn't there and left before I came there, we, I never saw media in those sessions at all. And, and we didn't have time to mix the album at all. So we had to leave and, and we had some like basic ideas of the sound in general, uh, like based on the recorded sounds. And when Ahti started to mix it, we just told him that, okay, make it, make it good and send it to us when it's ready. And Ahti did all the balancing and mixing. And I remember when I got the, got the CD in mail and okay, we have the mix now. What the, this sounds like shit. And I was so disappointed that I wanted to like call Ahti and I'm going to take another flight there and we're going to mix it again, but I didn't have any money for that. And it wasn't, wasn't that bad. It was just not what I expected. It, it, it wasn't like screechy and black metal-ish enough. Not that I wanted like go full Borgnagar's debut, but it was like too clean and too weird and and, and then, then we went to master it in Finvox with Mika. And, and then I could breathe better after the mastering. Then I, I especially remember thanking Mika that, okay, thanks. You, you really saved this mix. Thanks a lot, dude. And I don't know what happened. Maybe we should have been there ourselves. But that, that was a, like a catastrophe of mixing. Long story, sorry. No, no. This is really interesting and things that we wouldn't know to ask about you know so yeah um but very very interesting to hear yeah this is what makes the podcast really this is the the golden nuggets of of what we're doing <laughs> picking your brain yeah and then you can advertise it like these uh never heard secrets i, I was wondering <laughs> this uh the intro to the last song i've told you before that uh the intro is 99% the same as Bathory. Except Corthon's album came out after yours. So unless it's from some sort of movie with this uh, port thing, the seagulls and the bells and everything, and he used the exact same thing, he was a Moon Sorrow fan back then. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I do actually know where it is from. Uh, that's uh, You are referring to the Sankari Tarina, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, that's Marcos, Marcos' melody and riff, and I am fully aware where that is from. It's from the score of Cull the Conqueror. The, the movie soundtrack from Cull the Conqueror, made by Joel Goldsmith in 1997, uh, there is this theme, it goes like... It goes like that, so it's really close to the Sankari Tarina theme in general. And uh, we were laughing about that with Marco because Marco introduced, introduced us to that movie and that soundtrack. And we listened to that soundtrack a lot. And then he pointed out at some point that, yeah, by the way, remember that uh, the Cal movie we checked out? Haven't you, didn't you notice that this riff that I brought to you, brought to you today, is, it's sounding exactly like the movie soundtrack. Yeah, that's just, you know, it's good. It, we're a movie soundtrack metal. Um, but but yeah, check it out. It's it's uh, a bit bit same. Does that also uh, include the uh, like the fairy ports and this ding 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 in the background and then the dur, dur, but it's everything combined. Like, where is this part of the intro from? Is it from a movie or or what? This no, I I always build those myself, but 
as we talked about yesterday about these samples being just you know like ripped and dragged from anywhere i've made it myself but it might be that the whatever the seagulls are from one place and the yeah the bells are from some place and now when i can't even remember that we had some seagulls or no, but that's the thing that when you listen to Norland 2 by Bathory, it's the mm. exact same like parts of the bell and the fucking seagulls and something like that. And you're like, what the hell? And it came out like six months after yours. But are they like exactly? Can you like, you know, like line them up and see? I think the so. Yeah, I think that's so. Really weird. That, that's really weird. I, I want to check it out at some point. It's just if you really like crank up the volume from the first 10, 15 seconds before everything really starts mm. and you do the same with, uh, I think it's Heimfeld or something. I think that's the song. Heimfeld, yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's yeah. the last in Nordland one, Heimfeld. Yeah. If you listen to the first 20 seconds, you will hear San Caritarina, San Caritarina, like, San Caritarina. Yeah, and it's so weird because it's after your, your yeah, album. I'm not so thought. sure that it is like 100% like carbon copy. Yeah, I need to definitely check it out at some point. So I want to get into Kivan Kanteya specifically, but before getting into Kivan Kanteya specifically, we're now like chronologically, we're at like 2003. And within the next two years, you did Kivan Kanteya, Vizoram Slutet, Not Fod, Vrisaket, and it just seems like maybe from the way you also described it, it seemed like around that time you really came into your own as a composer and as a as a songwriter. And I'm wondering if you remember any of the changes of mindset or new things you learned or any anything that sort of took you from 2002 to 2003. What was the difference in your approach to music? Computers. That, that, that's the the it's so easy to answer computers and i got myself like gear which i could actually use so and at that time i didn't have anything you know no kids no job fucking nothing yeah well i had a relationship but as an aut autistic guy that i am uh, that was mostly concentrating on my personal music musical endeavors endeavors and uh I was just breathing like album after album. And well, to be honest, I, I got a total fucking burnout in 2006. So it's basically, there's a reason it, it looks weird that I pushed out so much stuff, but, but it came with a cost and I didn't have anything else on my table at the time. So I could just go completely nuts. I wake up, I do music, go to sleep. That was my days. And given that luxury in 2022, while being 30, 34, yeah, 43, getting 44 later this year, it, it would be a fucking failure of life if I would have lived the same life now that I lived when I was like in my 20s. Take note, Yari Menpa. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, uh, actually, nobody knows Yari's like he, he could actually have a like really nice job family uh you know this car loan he has to pay each month and the middle class stuff and we are just concentrating on on his musical stuff and we are demanding maybe he has like three adhd kids or something and he he takes his all all his time there we know we don't know so one of the things that we i guess what we uh talked about in the transition from Voimasa, we on the podcast will be talked about is Voimasa sounds so much like the Finnish metal sound and the, you know, the, the Ensiferum iron and all that stuff. It's not exactly the same, but a lot of those like classic albums that people who really like folk metal listen to, a lot of those came after the Moon Sorrow stuff that was kind of of the folk metal era. And I guess what we're wondering is on <clears throat> Kivan Kanteya, when you went a lot more grand and epic and orchestral, was it kind of like you were talking about with Tamayukuin and Talvi, where it was like 
an intentional trying to like seeing what other people were doing and trying to up the game or was it more of just naturally where the music went and you never really thought about what other people were doing i know one of those mm. answers is cooler but what but what <laughs> do you remember how you felt at the time oh well to be honest we always in a way we check out where others go and you know like give them a finger and go deliberately to the other way so whether we would it would be cool to say that yeah we don't give a shit but in a way at least I do give a shit because I don't want to do like what, what everybody else is doing. Why don't you do the same what everybody is doing? Well, I'd rather do something more fun and weird and, you know, unexpected. I like to puzzle people. In that way, Kiven Kantaya was, uh, that was like, we were in our own like musical bubble in a way that I remember like, I went to Marco's place or he went, he came to my home and we listened to this like Rip Wakeman albums and stuff like that. And we were like, man, this is so cool. We should definitely do something like that. And, and, and then because computers, uh, I, I got these like VST instruments and I could play a fucking Moog. Yeah, there was a ton of latency, but you know, who gives a shit? I could still get a Moog out of my keyboard and that was like so super cool that we kind of like went completely overboard and i'm not saying that's a bad thing but but we definitely like got so enthusiastic of, of all these possibilities that we can fucking do everything we want there's every single fucking instrument in our hands now because of computers and and because we we took inspiration from those old synth sounds it was kind of a natural that we also took inspiration from the over-the-top, grandiose, super pretentiously pompous 70s, like sword and sorcery prog albums, where like you had a b crappy, badly playing rock band on drugs backed up by a fucking symphony orchestra, because why not? And, and we thought we are kind of the same way that, yeah, this is just our poor man symphony orchestra like going all nuts with all this grandiose, super pompous stuff. And we, we just wanted to know, like, can we actually pull this thing off? Because we had so many ideas and we just wanted them to work. And they were surprisingly nicely. Do you remember which ideas came first? Oh, I think the first two songs were either Unaduksen Lapsi. I think I was working on Unaduksen Lapsi at my end, and Marco was working on Raunioilla. Then we kind of bounced them between. I remember doing Unaduksen Lapsi. I did some demo vocals with Ville where I just <laughs> sing something like that because it was just so fucking cool that I could actually like do stuff like that. I could actually send the guy an mp3, a music file, which he can listen at home without me having to be there and explain, because I had the possibility to record what I was thinking. And Marco had the same thing, that he could present me like already like a shitty demo of what he had been thinking, instead of coming to my place and showing me how to play it and what he want, how it he how he wants it to go, and, yeah. and all that was so so like it was a really like a gate opener for us. What DAW were you using? Uh, at the time, I was using Nuendo, but like into it because uh, Kevin Kanta was I think it was released in two thousand and three. But when we were doing it, composing it, it was two thousand and two. And at the time, I was using Nuendo. I switched switched to Cubase uh, after afterwards. And you're still on Cubase? Yes. One like specific question about that album that I've been wondering for so long. No, it's your time. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. Who sings the who the first melody? Well, not the first melody, but the the main vocal line, the main clean vocal line on Raunioila. That's me. Okay. Yeah, perfect. 
for uh, I, I think what meeting somewhere, but yeah, maybe not then. No, no, I, I, I always thought it sounded like you, and then for whatever reason, at some point in my life, I maybe it's because live, you're not there, but yeah. I think you're credited for like lead vocals on the album, and I'm guessing it's because of that. Yeah, oh, I was the only guy who had the balls to do it, despite of my lack of, let's say that I can stay on a note because of my this absolute pitch thing, it's not impossible for me to sing somehow clean. It's just that I was blessed in that. I definitely am, ain't blessed for what it comes to my sound because I sound like a fucking nasal girl most of the time I open my mouth and that just, well, my workmates refer me to as Joe Pesci, the actor. <laughs> just short, yeah. short, short tempered guy who speaks like this all the time. Don't make a fuck out of me. You want to embarrass me? Make a fool out of me? You didn't gamble? Tell me you gambled the fucking money. I'll give you the fucking money to put the fucking heat on. What, yeah, that's what's funny. funny exactly what I mean. Yeah, but, you know, as, as a fellow nasally voiced person, you made it cool. So, like, listening to you do it Wait, is like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, and uh, I think it's today or tomorrow when uh, Abel puts up the uh, first part of uh, Kivin Kante podcast, and you have Susan doing his nasally impression of Raoni Euler. <laughs> uh, and uh, Alexi. So oh, we, we Alexi. got to experience yeah. the yeah. same thing of like, okay, like who wants to sing this? <laughs> we made uh, an amazing Raoni Euler. You will want to throw your Kivin Kanta out of the window when you hear it. You will see. <laughs> So on something like the decision to have the ending of You Mountain Kalpunki, uh, the way that it was, I don't even know if you think of it as the ending of You Mountain Kalpunki because it's not on the album uh, on the title. It's you know including I don't remember the title. I'm not a real Moon Sorrow fan apparently. Or something like that. Yeah, we lay really into those including things. That is the intro though. That is the huh? intro. The outro doesn't have a name, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Or is it the intro's name? That is the intro, yeah. And the outro doesn't really have a name. Leave it alone. Where did that come from? Do you remember the idea to do that? Was it a natural thing that, like, that's how the song goes? Or was it, like, what the song was over was... and you thought, what if it wasn't? That was Marcos' riff. Uh, we made most of Jumalt and Kaupunki together. It's Originally, it was Marcos' song. And uh, I think it was pretty much until to the... Let me... I'm having a gap in my memory. But basically, when, hap when it happens, that's... And that's my riff, and I was opposing to him, like, man, this is just, you know, it's too balsidal, we can't use that, this is not moose or at all, fuck off, it's just fine, we put triple, triple kick drums there and go nuts, and, and I remember we, we, the first part of the song was basically already demoed by Marco, and then we just continued from the spot that he kind of had left the song, and he forced me to use use that Balsaga riff there, and uh, after we ended it, he like or went to the point where the riffs end, and we come to this break where the guitar starts. And Mar Marco said that he has this one guitar idea that could work nicely somewhere, and and we, well, let's just put it, you know, put it after this one because why not? At that point. You know, at that time, I think, in a way, I do miss those times, but I don't miss those times. In a way, uh, it was such so easier to to do music because you didn't give a shit. Can can, can we put this riff after that one? Well, of course we can. You know who gives a shit? You didn't give a thing. You just put riff after riff after riff. Nowadays, you do music. 
Well, I think those bass lines should go after the passing note to that stuff. And then there is this contrapunctual thing. How very metal is that? But This riff might <laughs> offend someone. Let's not do it. <laughs> Please, God, let this riff offend everyone. And then do so bad riff that it offends anyone, everyone. Anyway, uh, back to the point where the guitar thing, the mute guitar da, 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 starts, that's like, that's a good uh, example of how mine and Marco's collaboration mind works musically. Uh, he brought that thing to the table and then this uh, tapping doo -doo 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 thing that goes. And I just filled the blanks and I started immediately hear, hear things in my head and compose the last melody to that, which fades out then and those uh, like chords underneath the whole thing that, and I think it works really well. In if I'm really, that's one of those like good things in Munzoro's musical history, which I can still like. To this day, I can say, that, yeah, this actually sounds pretty nice. Yeah, it's it's my top five stuff at least. Yeah, it, it's a good ending for us song. Yeah, really good. I'm really happy because this was something we talked about on the podcast already, but. I'm a huge fan of Balsagot stuff, and I was wondering oh. if <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. I was going to ask you the question, but you answered it before. <laughs> yes. Is that Starfire? Yeah, that, this is my favorite one, but I have all of them several times in, <laughs> in many uh, CD cases, but this one is it's just the shit. It's too, too great. <laughs> Yeah, it's fucking awesome. Lo and behold. Thank you. <laughs> Do you, kind of on the subject of that ending of New Mountain Kalpunki, do you more often have a chord progression and some music and then find the melody on top of it? Or is it um, more often that you have this melody and then you think about like what might go under it? New Mountain Kalpunki the ending was completely based on the chord progression and the, the, the pattern that Marco had built. Or like, let's put it that way, Jumalta and Kaupunki built on top of Marco's pattern. And uh, then, be, then came the chord progression and then the melody just appeared because it should, be, should go like that. So I, I think basically now that actually this topic has been brought up, I think it's more easier for me. It's like a, it's either two ways. Uh, either I get an idea of a melody, or then I have, and in the, in that case, I hear the melody and the chords already. But it can also happen another way that I hear the chords and then I start to like, well, not necessarily fish for a melody, but I usually can come up really fast. Let's say that. Let's be in a hypothetical situation that me and Marco are sitting now in this room and we think that, okay, we, we could use a melody here. And maybe I could like fish up something from my mind, like, okay, we, should, we could start like this and, and then like uh, develop it a bit. Uh, because uh, as I mentioned yesterday, that I don't sit down and try different things with Moose or all. What I do in a way that when I start to like finesse and like develop things, that might be the time when I actually like try out different things. And what if I, should I go like from, instead of G, should I go to D, for example? And should I stay in this D a bit longer and then make the leap back to the other D and like more kind of a traditional composing in a way? Do you we kind of touched on this yesterday when we talked about it. I know that there is no one characteristic of the moon sorrow sound that you've said that you feel completely beholden to, but there's also certain elements of the moon sorrow sound that have been like really consistent. Uh, like for example, like the triplet feel Yeah. on you want actually there was, um, I forget which song just drop. I think it might've been uh Sudan Tunti at one point completely drops the triplet feel. And that was a very weird moment for a time I was listening to it because 
suddenly it didn't sound like a typical Moon Sorrow song uh, at all. But I'm just kind of curious when you're talking about like your composing process and, and so on, are there, have you noticed any things that just consistently feel right for Moon Sorrow in terms of any aspect of um, harmony or rhythm or? Well, the, the triplet feel with the kicks, 16th triplet kicks is definitely a Mozart thing. And another one, like, again, based on drumming is those, uh, like, da, ta, 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 ta. we get a lot of those, like, uh, floor toms soon to, like, Paul muted guitars to mm -hmm. emphasize them. It's kind of a classic metal thing in a way, like Man of War. There's a lot of that stuff in Musaro stuff. And, and of course, we basically just taking it from, you know, Metallica, Man of War, bands, Testament, bands who used to do that. And that all goes back to classical music in a way, like when you have timpanis and all these, like, let's say you have a horn section, you, you got those like bass trombone combined with two tenor trombones. That's your guitars. Put cellos there and you're already like, completely fucking metal but uh another like uh, trademark for our sound is that if you go back to any album of us ours uh you'll never find a pinging and ringing snare and every time we do an album the snare is rather large and like uh, deep in a way like a, we're talking about like a physically big snare drum because that's our thing no saint anger what yeah no no saint anger we we are not fans of after ring hey one thing actually two because i think we won't have time to go into into very second so there are two things so when recording our episodes we noticed it was in two moments but i just remember one but i'm sure the others remember the other one we have a song in, in voimasta we have a song which is hidden pelto that kind of foreshadows what will come afterwards but it's later and you kind of skip kiven kantaya in that I'm, i really hope that sasan or, or somebody else can explain it better yeah than, than I, I, I think I think when you kind of like go back and listen to some of the musical ideas, I think each album kind of tries a bunch of new things. And sometimes it feels like you, um, you then do that idea more on the next album. Sometimes you don't. So Heat and Pelto sounds a lot like a song that could have been on Varisa Ket in certain ways. But not on Kim Kanta, um, yeah. And there was, I think there was one in Sudanuni that with an element that appeared also in Kim and Kante, something like this. I don't remember how it was mm. exactly, but something that skipped, but foreshadowed the, the future. Yeah, I kind of get the idea, like given the, a bit different mood of Heat and Pelto, than the, it's, it's not that melod, melodic in a way that, well, it's a bit too slow in general. It's not, it's it's not one of those uh, key moments in Mozart's career for me, and uh, the, I think the biggest problem is, is that it's a bit too slow. It's like almost dragging in a way that we should have may, maybe arranged it a bit differently to be able to ride with that tempo. Because now the uh, like the Paul muted guitars and stuff, it's borderline too slow for that tempo. We should have done maybe something different, but what's done is done. But in that sense, if you would raise up the tempo for let's say like 10 BPM, 15 BPM, put that to the very second mix and overall just evilize it a bit, I think it would have suited the, uh, that album really nicely. But, but definitely unintentional, let's put it that way. Well, this is just a book club version of us uh, dissecting everything that you guys have <laughs> ever done and completely uh, screwing over, uh, bringing in projections and everything of our feelings into something that yeah. you probably never, ever felt. And you're like, no, that was never my intention. <laughs> How did you get to that conclusion? 
Yeah, well, lots of people tend to have different opinions about how the song songs and their especially the lyrics should be interpreted. So people should get in line to t- tell us about that more. Yeah, it's interesting how the Boy Must album generally is so well, kind of bombastic, not as much as Kevin Kanta, yeah, because it doesn't have so many layers and everything. It's a different way of bombastic. Yeah, it's uh, like super uplift- uplifting, super epic. We have this, uh, we coined this term, dude on horse with a plastic sword, TM. And and then suddenly there is hidden belt, which is, I mean, it's not completely off the rest of the album, but stands out or stands in maybe because everything is so high up and then this goes a bit more calm and then goes back in in, in the last one. Yeah, and I, I think also what makes Hidden Belt kind of a drag in even more is that we are using the drop detuning here. So it's like a bit too slow and it's also like psychologically feels like too low because we are suddenly dropping our tuning of the guitars. So there's like, it basically feels like you're listening to 45 RPM stuff on 33 RPM in a way. Well, not that drastically, but you get the idea. Yeah. It's like, it should have just be pitched up and, and made it faster at the same time in the process. And the second question I wanted to ask about this, which actually covers the, the first three albums. Yesterday, when we asked you, what makes a Munsoro song? You said either the sadness or the aggression. And while I can see how that is true from very Saket on, it doesn't seem to apply that much to the first three albums. I mean, not, yeah, there are some sad songs or some aggressive songs, but generally that is not the general mood, I would say. You might be right that I'm looking, I'm skipping the first albums when I think of that. There is definitely point in that criticism and uh, yeah I think there is this certain like heroic aspect that has been missing since very second basically and uh, maybe we just thought that it's not really it does not represent more sort of I think I think it uh, started with very second and we, we kind of felt that this bombastic, heroic, uplifting stuff, it's not really our thing. And we wanted to do stuff a bit differently than, let's say, Enzifero. Like, no, absolutely no offense to Enzifero, but, but that's like their thing is the uplifting and heroic stuff with that. And we wanted to be those grumpy guys in the corner with leather pants, like, fuck off, we're more metal than you. And we've kept that way since. So there is a lot of this heroic uplifting stuff which has has been lost in the process. Well, fortunately, not completely lost because we have, for example, the ending of Tuli or, oh, or, yeah, yeah. or the ending of Ihmis and Aika, which have that element of a bit of it. And I think it fits really, really well. Is there a heroic element in Ihmis and Aika? Well, for me, this... But the old Musoro would have probably doubled that with horns. Yeah, <laughs> probably. But yeah, yeah, well, in a way, I just take I take those like heroic moments more like literal fucking heroic moments, like with these uh, leaps of I- fifth interval, kind of a Superman themes and Star Wars and John Williams esque stuff. That's like heroic stuff for me. And I find that more in those uh, earlier Musaro albums and not anymore in the new ones. But in You Melt and Aika, you have some pro. <laughs> yes, yes, we have those. <laughs> Which are, yeah, kind of kind of bombastic too. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, but they are like uh, with you, Martin. Like, uh, I and mean, in generally, we could had already used like uh, proper sample libraries to actually do like actual actual horns. But it's a fucking synth because we love that sound, <laughs> that aesthetic, a great deal, and it it's basically it it needs to be a synth horn. It it needs to have this certain. 1995 feeling in it. Falkenbach feel. <laughs> What? Falkenbach feel. Yeah, but you know this sort sort of warm, crappy synth. Like uh, this, there is this some sort of like uh, when we do stuff with Moonsoro and the synths, we we definitely don't be there like with this uh, like very serious like this has to be like this. Uh, we have a lot of fun with the synth sounds and. And we might intentionally have like these, uh, like nostalgically bad sounds, but in a way, I don't think it's it's kind of our trademark because we have done this nostalgically bad sounds since our like beginning already. So we we never kind of we we never went somewhere else and then came back to fish for nostalgia. We we just always loved those sounds so much. That, that we end up using these bad sounds. It was actually my number one on my most wished things to appear on the next album. That was exactly this, and then you have you the first song, that. and you're like, well, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we laughed with Marcus about this, like at least for a couple of albums already that, uh, We use a lot of his work Triton, and whenever there is something of power, something power, there's a word power in the patch is always good. We ended up using like patches like power bells, brass of power. That's the sound. That's brass of power. Power piano is our go-to piano in all our Mozart albums since Berry Saket, I think. And just every patch with power on it, it it's a moose or a patch. And and we have a lot of fun when we are doing those. So you will be getting more brass of power in the future too. We are nearing <laughs> 10 p.m. or year 11. So yeah. Thank you so much for talking to us about all of this and speaking so candidly. Um, it's been really gratifying and very kind of you to take the time. Had you ever done such a long interview? Uh, not really, but I think uh, it's much more easier to do an interview. Like, first of all, I know half of you personally already, and and it's like more like a conversation with friends. And the second, I'm sitting at my own home, safely tucked behind a screen. These two aspects already like give the opportunity to actually do an interview this long. Like imagine going to a festival and then giving an interview in the backstage for somebody badly in English speaking German. <laughs> Listen to Jerry's bad jokes. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't give a shit about your band but has to do that? And then you sit there for three hours, like, oh yes. <laughs> We sing the finish because. <laughs> <laughs> so in that sense it's the the pleasure has been all mine but this was it's also the, the 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 goal of this that this was exactly what we were aiming for to have super uh low-key down-to-earth conversation so it's yeah. it's really been everything we wanted it to be an interview yeah. by nerds for the other maybe three nerds that are yeah. out there listening to the us five people yeah. listening to us yeah i always five. joke that the only people who would listen to this podcast are already in this podcast so <laughs> <laughs> which which makes sense in the sense of moon sorrow making music for moon sorrow and no one else yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that's. I think that's the most important. I know it's a fucking cliche and everything, but you should always stay true to yourself, and you know, the rest comes afterwards.
All right, we have reached the end of the episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again to Henry for being with us. Thanks to you for listening. And the next full episode will be very sacred. See you then. Goodbye. Praise Satan. Hail the hordes. Well, this was awesome. Yeah. yeah. So that went great. That was- yeah. I'm trying not to scream as a 13 year old in my head. I, I, I just, <laughs> I just,